Good morning. I invite you to take the hymnal from the pew rack in front of you, and we will open worship with hymn number 296. Brethren, we have met to worship. Let's stand and sing together. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're thankful for another day that we've never seen before. We thank, we're thankful for your mercies, which are new every single morning. We confess that this has been a busy week and sometimes we've been able to place our eyes off of you. <clears throat> However, we're thankful, God, that even when we place our eye off of you, you still have your eyes straight on us. And so, Father, we ask for this time of worship to be fruitful. We ask God for this time of worship to be helpful. And most of all, we ask God that this worship may challenge us to be better disciples and bearers of you and your word. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to worship. My Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made, and you and I both should rejoice and be glad in it. And I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I know I am. I mean, because there are some people that did not make it. Amen? And so we're excited that we did make it into the house of the Lord. And keeping with this whole theme of rejoicing, we can be excited because we're celebrating baptism today. Can we give God a round of applause for that? Amen. Baptism is definitely not to be taken lightly as it is where a believer publicly professes that they believe in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly why the whole church exists. Amen. And so we want to welcome our friends and our visitors who have come with us into this house of worship. And we invite you at this moment to feel free to fill out a Connect card. I promise you may say, why? Why do you want me to fill out this? You don't need my information. Well, we really do, because we want to welcome you into our family, tell you a bit more about our family. And so at this time, I invite you, if you are a visitor, to take out one of those Connect cards that's located in the pew back and fill it out. You can put it in the offering receptacle, or you can bring it and place it um, right there. When you go outside of the door, there's a table, and they have a lot of different gifts that you can pick and assort from. 
Well, my friends, I have only a couple of announcements, I promise, because as I always tell you, you're quite astute people. And so I don't want to read what is already in front of you. However, I just want to remind you that our, we're having our church and conference January 27th, and we want all of our Speedo members to be in attendance. However, there's going to be food. And so, and, and, and so that we may be able to plan accordingly, I want you to please, please, please call the church office, RSVP, so that we can have something with your name on it and enough food to fill your stomach. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> However, I have my last question, and then we're going to continue with worship. If you were able to change the world, would you do it? Raise your hand if you would. If you were able to really change the world, would you? Would you? Well, guess what? I have a prime opportunity <laughs> for each and every one of you. My friends, we are in the middle of our Buckhead Christian Ministries food drive. And with that being said, we have receptacles and, and bins all over the church. There's one in the North Bridge exit and one in the Family Life Center, even one at the entrance of the preschool. Now, I need everybody to come here, bring some food so that people's lives can be changed. Amen? Because there are people that are not, they, they're not where we are. And the winter months are coming. I'm sure you got up. I know I got in my car and it was 32 degrees. And I said, oh my God, can you warm it up? <laughs> However, there are some people that they're not able to have food. And we can change the world right now if we bring food and we all come together and partner with Buckhead Christian Ministries to be able to be the light in darkness and add joy to somebody's life. Will you do that for me? I got a couple of people and that's all I need. <laughs> Amen. And so keeping with the spirit of rejoicing and changing the world, I want to simply read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, where we see how Christ changed our world. First Peter chapter 3 verses 18 through 22 says these words, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Let us continue in worship.
This is Ethan Rotz, and you know Ethan because he has grown up right here in front of your eyes. His parents, Joy and Steve, our minister of music, have raised him in a home of Christian love. And with that influence and his participation in the children's ministry of this church, he has heard all of his life about God's love for him and about Christ's call to follow. And so a couple of months ago, he came to my office and told me that he wants to be a Christian. He wants to follow Jesus, not only in the waters of baptism, but with his whole life. He wants to devote his life to living for Christ. And so, Ethan, what is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Well, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized in Christ, with Christ in death and raised to walk in newness of life. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray your blessing on Ethan's life, protection from harm of body or spirit, and a life in the abundance of your love. Might he know through each stage of his living that you love him. Might he say yes to each beckoning call of your spirit. And might you protect him all the days of his life in the love you have called him and us to. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the response of reading printed in your bulletin. O oh Lord, you desire truth in our inward being. Teach us wisdom in our secret heart. Send out your light, send out your truth, and let them lead us to our home. Take from us the weight of our sin, that room might be made for the spirit of truth. If we prepare a dwelling place, that spirit will abide within us, and the truth will set our spirits free. Then shall we love not only in word or in speech, then shall we love in deed and in truth. And by this know that our service is faithful. O Lord, you desire truth in our inward being. Teach us wisdom in our secret heart. Our scripture reading from Psalm 34 says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. As we sing hymn, hymn number 692, I invite the children to come forward during the third stanza to meet with Miss Heather for the children's sermon to follow. Let's stand and sing.
good morning, boys and girls. It is certainly a great thing to see you all here this morning. And today is an awesome day for our church. So I want everyone just to go like this. Yes. All right, ready? Today is an awesome day. Can we all do a, a hand motion to say yes together? Ready? Yes. Oh, I hardly heard you children. Can you try it again? Today is an awesome day. Yes. I think we can get the whole congregation to join in now. Ready? And we want it to resound. Is everyone ready? Today is an awesome day. Yes. That was great. Good job. All right. Now, you may be wondering why we're cheering today because today... Like I said, it's an awesome day because we celebrated baptism. Ethan was baptized today, and that's a big thing. So everybody, one more time. Today is an awesome day. Yes, because today we saw a young man commit his life to the Lord and decide to follow Jesus in baptism, and that is an awesome thing. You remember last week, some of you were here in kids' worship. We were talking about when Jesus was baptized. Do you remember that story, some of you? And you remember he was really excited to be baptized. He wanted to be baptized by his cousin John, and he was. And some special things happened when he was baptized. Remember, the Father's voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm pleased. And then the Spirit descended down from heaven on Jesus like a dove. Every part of the Trinity was there. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And you might have just noticed just now, when Pastor Doc baptized Ethan, he said, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Every baptism has that as part of it. Because when we choose to follow Jesus, we're becoming part of the Father's family. We're following the example and the life of the Son. And when we're baptized, we have the gift of God's Spirit to be with us and to guide us always. Now, some of you have been baptized before, and others of you may not have chosen to do that yet and that's okay the time is different for every person I waited till I was 16 because that's when I was ready that's when God called me to follow him and when he follows him or when you hear him ask you to follow him do you know how you'll know it you won't know it in your ear you'll know it in your heart you'll know that it's time to give your life to him and to follow him in baptism and my prayer for each of you is that one day you'll make that decision. It's a beautiful thing, and it changes your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him. Dear God, today is an awesome day. Thank you for this beautiful baptism of Ethan that we've seen and experienced as your family gathered here in this place. And Lord, we ask that as you speak to each of these children's hearts, as they grow and as you guide them, that they will hear your voice and that one day they'll choose to come and follow you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we love you. Thank you for loving us, God. And Lord, help us to serve and to show others your love because we have been given so much. Oh, Lord, thank you for this awesome day and these awesome boys and girls. May you bless them always. Amen. to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. God set the stars to give light to the world. The star of my life is Jesus.
in line with Josh's uh, words earlier on, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, and I hope you were. In God's house, we study his word for truth and seek his will for our lives. We praise him with joyful song, and we bring our gifts to him who has given us all that we have. Join me in prayer. Our Father, we offer our, offer our gifts to you with humble hearts. May they be used to bring glory to your name. Amen. We continue hearing the voices of the minor prophets. Today, our scripture comes from the prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, for the day when I arise as a witness. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation at the heat of my anger, 
for in the fire of my passion all the earth shall be consumed. At that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my supplicants, my scattered ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of all the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove you from your midst, your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. For I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, the, the remnant of Israel. They shall do no wrong and utter no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. And they will pasture and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Let us pray. Lord, we are not afraid. We're not afraid when we lie in the trust and the comfort of your pasture and your ways. And we do give you thanks this day that you continue to provide. Not just providing food and shelter and safety, but that you provide for us a clear way to live that leads to the life abundant. And we offer our confession that we've lived short of your way for us. We know how to live with kindness and generosity, but we just keep choosing shortcuts to happiness. And we pray your forgiveness. When we live in fear instead of trust, we also gather in faithless ways with people who are just like us, who don't challenge us, who don't threaten our ease. And so on this weekend, when we celebrate the contributions of Dr. King, we confess that we too, too often, have lived in fear of the other. And we pray that you would forgive us. You've demanded from us trust and obedience, and over and over we have responded in selfish fear that leads to small living. Forgive us. Awaken us to the life abundant that is ours through Jesus Christ. Awaken us like the day of our baptism, even as we celebrate with Ethan today we pray that you might reignite the fire that was ours on the day of our baptism, opening our sails to your Holy Spirit that we might instead choose generosity and goodness and kindness and forgiveness, that we would choose compassion and scandalous love. Move us closer to being the church and the person you have called us to be in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
in the hard, cold winter weeks of January and February, we're listening to the voices of the minor prophets. Sometimes this collection of prophets, referred to as the Book of the Twelve, but I'm only preaching seven. You might say, thanks be to God. They're called a justice and right living for the people of God spans 3,000 years in our redemptive history. The first two prophets, Amos and Micah, you'll remember preached during a time of prosperity. Israel was on a roll, money was flowing, business was thriving, there was peace in the land. But you might also remember that the peace they were enjoying was because Assyria, the great military powerhouse, had their hands full. The Assyrian army was dealing with attacks from Asia Minor. So while they were slugging it out on the playground, Israel was able to enjoy their time in the sandbox without anybody bothering them at all. But eventually Assyria took care of business with Asia Minor expanded their territory, looked around for other kingdoms to conquer, and well, the northern kingdom of Israel was right next door, and Israel looked about as tough as Woody Allen. So, 722 B.C., the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrian army. There is a new flag in the ground, a new culture has taken over, and Israel has a new king named Manasseh. Their new king couldn't yet shave. He was 12. That helps to put a 12-year-old as king. It helps you just kind of keep your hand on things. The new Assyrian leaders didn't have to worry about not getting their way and doing what they wanted. And Manasseh opened the door wide for Assyria's pagan culture to flourish. And here's a sum of what he sanctioned. These things are listed in 2 Kings. He allowed widespread idolatry, even opening the doors of the temple to worshiping Canaanite gods. He supported temple prostitution. The royal court was commanded to wear Assyrian attire, and pagan magic was introduced into everyday life. So you get the picture. God's chosen people don't look much like God's chosen people anymore. They've adopted the dress, the values, the priorities of the culture. They've turned their back on God. And now you can't tell the people of God from the greedy, self-serving aggressors that make their way in the world through power and force and indulgence. They all look the same. And God has had enough. Because of Israel's idolatry and indifference to God, the Lord is ready to utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Actually, that's a direct quote. Chapter 1. God is so disgusted with how people, the people of God have abandoned their worship and their ethics, God is ready to reverse the Genesis order and just wipe the board and start over. Now, we usually like to focus on the attributes of God that we like the most. God is generous and forgiving and loving and compassionate, but God is also jealous. God demands our worship and our obedience. God's good creation works when people care for each other, care for the earth, care for the disadvantaged. They love, they forgive. When God's attributes, generosity and forgiveness and love and compassion, are being lived out among the people of God, then life has order and delight. But when people turn those values upside down, when they live stingy and petty and bigoted and uncaring, when the created order turns in on itself, nothing works like it's supposed to. And our selfishness leads to death. God set up the rules because God loves us. God's rules are not to punish us. They're in place because obedience to them is the most satisfying way to live. 
Worship and obedience to God is the way that life works best. You remember when Hurricane Andrew struck uh, Florida in 1992, it was a Category 5 storm <coughs> that just devastated South Florida. Well, there was a TV news crew on assignment after the storm, and they interviewed the, the owner of a house that was still standing after the storm. In the scene of the camera, you could see the devastation. There was debris everywhere, but there was this one house still on its foundation. Now, it, it was damaged, but it was, it was still upright. Now, the homeowner's out front cleaning up his front yard. The reporter approaches him with the camera, and she says, Sir, why is your house the only one still standing? How did you manage to escape the severe damage of the hurricane? He said, I built this house myself. I also built it according to the Florida State Building Code. When the code called for two by six roof trusses, I used two by six trusses. I was told that a house built according to code could withstand a hurricane. I did, and it did. I suppose no one else around here followed the code. That's what we're talking about. God has a code, a way to build our lives that leads to the most satisfying outcomes for us, for those right around us, for society as a whole. But ever since the Garden of Eden, we've decided that we know better. We just rather choose to live selfishly. We'd rather adopt the culture's values instead of God's values. Everybody else is building their house without regard for the code. I might as well, too. It doesn't work that way. And God has had enough. And God keeps appealing for repentance. God keeps trying to call the covenant people back, but Israel's just completely unmoved. Listen to this appeal from chapter 2. Gather together, oh, gather together, O oh shameless nation, before you're driven away like the drifting chaff. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. And the people of God said, nah, we got this. In the preaching of Zephaniah, God tells the Israelite people, that their self-centered neglect of God and God's ways has gone far enough. And in today's scripture, Zephaniah preaches God saying, I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones and you will no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. God is ready to wipe the board clean and start over. But, but, God also promises in our reading, I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel. God's redemptive project, reclaiming the world through love, will move forward with a small remnant who do structure their lives according to the code. They have not adopted the values and the priorities of the culture. They still worship. They operate as though God is the Lord of their lives. And it strikes me, it strikes me that what characterizes this group who constitute God's hope is not their creativity or their entrepreneurship or their can-do attitude. The people who change the world by reconstituting the people of God, are identified as the humble and the lowly. God will remove from your midst the proud, the exultant ones. And the ones who are left to carry on God's love project with the world will be the humble ones who seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Now, this, is, this isn't the only biblical reference to a remnant. I suppose Noah and his family were the first. 
But there's several other places where God has restarted the salvation drama with a few committed people who trusted in God's leadership and did not conform their lives to the culture. 20th century author and anthropologist Margaret Mead wrote, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And she's right. Name one movement that did not start with a handful of people looking at each other and saying, what if? So much has been written about the decline of the church in America to make me wonder if the North American church is in a remnant time. Two weeks ago when Bill Wilson was here leading our deacon retreat, and keep in mind, Dr. Wilson is a church consultant who works with denominations all across the country. He, he has broad experience in these areas. And he said he does not know of one church that began before 1980 that does not have at least a thousand people in worship that is not in decline, not one. Church starts and mega churches but he could not name one other church in the country not in decline. Friday I was asked to teach a class uh, at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. It was mostly Methodist ministers, and the, but there was one Methodist bishop in the class. And, and in that group I told that story about what Bill Wilson told us the other Saturday. And at the break the bishop came up to me with a pad and pen. He said, give me that again. After he'd written it down, I said, can you think of one exception to that in the Methodist church? And he said, nope, not one. That's the reason I needed to write the quote down. In my experience, he's absolutely true. Are we in a remnant time? Perhaps. I don't know. There was a day when people used to have to get here early to get a seat in a 1,200-seat sanctuary. And now there are 300 of you or so here today. Are you a remnant people? Perhaps. But if so, here's what I know about remnants. When they are humble and seek their refuge in God, God has been known to show up and do great things. Every new exciting expression of God's work has come about because a small group of thoughtful, committed, humble people got together and sought God's leadership among them. There's a small group in this congregation, a small group of young adults who meet on Tuesday nights. They have a meal together. They pray together. They talk about living their faith in the fast, big pressured city. And I don't know what's going to come of that group. But I've seen what God can do with a remnant. Now I can't mention every small group, but I want to tell you about two more groups that are just getting underway. One group starting out socially. It's a, it's a group right now they're still gathering email addresses, but they're going to choose, it's a group of singles in this church and they're going to be inviting their friends. They're going to choose eight restaurants on Buford Highway, do a singles night out dinner club format to form new Christian single relationships. If you're not on the list and need to be, email me. I don't know what's going to come of it. Don't know. But I, had, I know what God can do with a remnant group who's humble and loves. Did you know that our church has 20 attorneys? <laughs> I know. They've already been meeting some in smaller groups. They're getting to know each other. There have already been some creative conversations about uh, pro bono work or Bible studies for lawyers, other ideas. But at the end of this month, one of them is hosting a dinner party for all of our Second Ponce attorneys and their spouses. 
and they're going to dream, and they're going to pray, and they're going to ask, what if? What if? Who knows? Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. In Zephaniah's day, the people of God stopped looking like the people of God. They adopted the values and priorities of the culture. They turned their back on God. They began to look like the greedy, self-serving aggressors who make their way through power and force and indulgence. And I'll bet temple attendance was in the pits too. But when God gets down to a faithful remnant who are humble and prayerful and who continue to live their lives by the code of God's goodness, God has a history of doing some really, really remarkable things. Now most of what leads to renewal in the kingdom of God is God's work. But our work is to worship, remain obedient, and commit to being the humble ones who seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Let's stand and sing. Go now and be humble. Go and be obedient. And go and seek the Lord. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us again today. You honor us by allowing our broadcast into your life. As you can see behind me, I'm in our beautiful but now empty sanctuary. But on Sunday mornings when this room is alive, this is my favorite place and my favorite hour of the week. We sing and pray and hear scripture together. And we become formed into community by God's presence with us. I know that some of you are not physically able to join us on Sundays, and I'm delighted that this broadcast lets us come to you. But if you are able to be with us, 11 o'clock on Sunday may end up becoming your favorite hour of the week too. Home or here, I hope you will worship with us again soon. <laughs> 